uh, uh, nearly real time, and uh, this way a great audience, a large audience of people was reached that looked at these wonderful pictures. Now, um, Julie is active at the ISS office in JSC. Uh, in her function as a chief scientist, she coordinates the science that goes on on the International Space Station. That is, she interacts between the scientists, the investigators, the mission manager, and the operations team to make sure that everything goes smooth, the priorities are taken, and uh, the results come in time to the scientists on Earth. Uh, Chile has also uh, written a book, uh, which is entitled uh, The International Space Station Benefits for Humanity, and you can imagine that some of this will also be presented today. Julie, we are all interested in the top 10 results and we are particularly interested in how you can limit it to so few. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm not sure who to blame for the top 10 concept. I think it might be J.D. Bartow sitting over there blushing in the front of the audience. So um, I thank you for that. Uh, it's actually a very fun challenge. And for those of us that are in the space community, it's a challenge because we're paying so much attention to hardware and programs and exploration and future plans that a lot of times the engineers and the designers and the businessmen don't really learn what's going on on the science side. And so it's easy to be uninformed about uh, some of the great results that are coming from the space station. However, as also the science, scientists in the scientific community, they're paying mostly attention to their own discipline. And the International Space Station is unique in that it supports almost every scientific discipline that I can think of in some way. So it advances every discipline with an innovation opportunity. And then those scientists have to take that knowledge and bring it back down to the ground and do a lot of work to turn it into the final product or the final thing that makes people say, wow, what an amazing discovery. And so each of the benefits, the top 10 results that I'll talk to you about today have a story. And those that made my list today made my list for a number of reasons, which I'll tell you about. But one extra reason is that they had to have something exciting going on recently. And some of these stories evolve over a pretty long period of time. So let me start with just a little bit of context for why we would talk about the top results from a platform like the space station. Um, Humans explore in order to advance. And so Zheng Hu, in, from 1405 to 1433, with his seven expeditions to the Western Ocean, which was the Indian Ocean, um, from the perspective of China, was a great example of that. You can see a map of that world in 1402. Or Columbus, uh, here's a picture of his map when he crossed the Atlantic Ocean to discover, quote unquote, America in uh, 1492. Uh, neither of these great explorers who are honored and, and inspire us even today did it to inspire the children of their countries. Um, Zheng Hu did not explore to inspire the children of China. He explored to advance the economic interests of China, to find trading partners, to find resources, to discover new technologies and new ideas. Similarly, Columbus did not explore to inspire the children of Spain. He explored to find new economic opportunities for Spain, uh, new ways to trade, new sea routes, perhaps claim new lands. And then the scientists come behind those early explorers. The explorers have to push the boundary to get humans to that place. And then the scientists come behind, and those scientists come behind sometimes hundreds, hundreds of years behind. And for example, James Cook, was an explorer with the HMS Resolution, but by this point in time, he brought scientists with him on his voyages. Now these were intrepid scientists, and many of them died along with the rest of the crew. But unlike Columbus, who was only exploring and brought no scientists along, at this point in exploration history, there was enough knowledge to be gained from those new places that collection of scientific data became an important goal for that mission to be complete and for uh, Britain at that point to get the knowledge value out of that exploration endeavor. 
But then, even as the first scientists start collecting data, it takes even more time for that data to turn into knowledge and that knowledge to turn into theory or discovery. And a great example of that is Charles Darwin, after his voyage of the Beagle in 1831, he looked at his samples, he thought about what he had observed, he reprocessed his data, he came up with such innovative ideas, he was afraid to tell anyone about them, so he checked his data again. And in 1859, nearly 30 years after he went on that voyage, when he heard somebody else might publish some more ideas, he finally rushed it to publication, and that was on the origin of species. So this is um, an exploration example, but it proves a point that is just as true today, which is that science takes time. I'll often be asked by uh, a reporter or a legislative ass assistant, well, what happened, what have you done this week? What discovery was made on the ISS this week? And that's not the way that science works. In fact, what we see is it takes a scientist from six months to five years to get their idea funded and into space. Once they've got their funding, it takes them another six months to five years to get, get it flown in space. Depending on if they have to use engineers and build hardware, then it's gonna take them longer. If they can reuse the great facilities that we have on the space station today, we have flown people in as little as six months from when they uh, had the funding to move forward with their idea. Then their data comes down, usually instantaneously, but they might have to wait for a flight to get some samples home, and then they might have to analyze those on, a grant, on the ground. So it might be 12 months before they've really got all the data down and interpreted and ready to analyze. And then after that, it takes them from two to five years for the first publication to come out in most disciplines. Now, some disciplines will turn it around pretty quickly, but that's an exception rather than the rule. Uh, in the scientific literature, there are objective measures called eigenvalues for how you measure the impact of a journal publication. And those factors aren't even computed until a paper has been published for five years. So you can't even measure the scientific impact of a publication until everyone else has time to think about it, cite that publication, build on it in their own experiments, and then learn what that means. So science moves slowly is the, the bottom line of that example. And we have to uh, be gentle with scientists, I'll ask of you engineers because uh, we hold each other to really high standards for being sure that the things that we've learned are true and for taking each step along the way. Of course, the International Space Station, as the most complex machine ever built by humans, is in orbit today. It's operating 24-7, 365, with six crew members, and they are doing research all the time. Uh, research racks are operating all the time, research facilities continue, and that throughput has grown extraordinarily over the last two years since we finished our assembly. And when, when people ask about the cost-benefit analysis, it's not just the research, but it's really the three main areas, and I think this is true for any space exploration program to any destination, that, that what you get from investing in space is you get the paybacks from the engineering investment in technology, in uh, future business, you get the international achievements from international cooperation, and then you get the research achievements as well. And the space station, uh, say 30 years from now, when it's been in the ocean for a while, uh, will be judged on the merits of all of these accomplishments, not just on the research achievements that I'll talk about today. But now that we're in the research phase, of course, the achievements that have come from the research and how that appears to be looking ahead as we continue to do more and more research is very important to our stakeholders. The stakeholders, the governments that fund the operation of the space agencies, they want to be sure that they're getting value for, for the taxpayers. And so the things that we do each year and how those keep growing into new benefits, new discoveries are really important for sustaining human spaceflight. Over 69 countries have participated in ISS utilization to date, and I think this is really important because you'll hear assumptions out there that sometimes only the ISS partner agencies use the space station. That's definitely not true. The international collaboration across the research community is mirrored on the ISS and mirrored in the activities that have gone on. The disciplines, as I mentioned, almost every major discipline of science has something to, to do on the ISS and something to gain from the ISS, including biology and biotechnology, human research, physical sciences, technology demonstration, astrophysics, 
healing physics, earth sciences, and education. And here they've been divided up sort of approximately by the interest in the commercial sector in research in those areas and the interest in government sector in, re in research in those areas. Because of course, government focuses more on, on fundamental research or applied exploration research, while commercial focuses more on product development that will be beneficial here on Earth, including pharma, pharmaceutical product development, and <coughs> materials development. And uh, this is just a quick representation for those same disciplines of the different ISS partners who represent all those countries I showed you and their, their choice in their portfolio of how much of their efforts would go into the different disciplines. Biology in blue, earth and space science in red, uh, educational activities in green, human research in purple, physical sciences in uh, kind of blue-green, and technology in orange. Across the over 1,500 uh, experiments that have been done on the space station to date. So once we accomplish the research on ISS, there are three areas where benefits come, and they are absolutely not mutually exclusive, uh, but they are pure discovery, or scientific discovery, space exploration, meaning both technology advancements and other knowledge that helps in future exploration endeavors, and Earth benefits. Those things that come back to Earth and make people's lives better, save lives, improve our daily lives or our quality of living. And those definitely overlap. A piece of research may have been selected and funded to go on the space station because it supported space exploration. But in fact, turns around a dividend that leads to a product on Earth that helps protect human health. And when that happens, it's crossed over from one sector to another. So they're definitely not exclusive. So picking the top 10, what did I do? Um, given the challenge from JD and the committee, I, I thought about it a little bit. I talked to my counterparts at the other partner agencies um, at, where we work together to keep track of all the results from the space station. And, um, and I took into account a few different criteria. So here they are. Uh, first, I looked at scientific journal quality. So I looked at the top journals that were out there and that had published results from ISS. I also looked at uh, the comments and the reviews of other scientists that have come into us both in an award selection endeavor that we've done uh, for a, a, a U.S. meeting called the ISS Research and Development Conference that's held every summer, uh, sponsored by the American Astronautical Society. I also looked for those cases where novel information um, had been presented, where it was just a brand new thought. And I thought those deserve some credit, even if nobody was citing them or they didn't get in a big journal because nobody could figure out why they cared. But I thought novel information was useful to think about as well. And then, very close to my heart, I looked at human benefits. And all of those, I think, are important considerations uh, in thinking about what will be, what's the research legacy. And of course, in asking me about the top 10 today, you're asking me to predict the future because I can't predict which of these when their story is through at the end, will still be as exciting as the promise they may show today. But I'm making, a, making my best prediction for you. And uh, even in looking at these top 10, and the title of this recognizes why limit it to so few. So I'm gonna tell you about a couple that I did not pick for the top 10, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I did not pick uh, the ultrasound application that is saving the lives of women and children in Kenya and Brazil and north of the Arctic Circle by providing better prenatal care. Uh, Bill Gerstemeyer talked about that today in his plenary. I didn't talk about the better materials leading to lighter turbine blades in engines by Boeing, which, uh, which DLR talked about in the plenary earlier today. I did talk about all the people who have been able to drink pure water in disaster zones using ISS technology. I didn't talk about the new discovery of vision impacts and a different way of looking at the human vision system and how it relates to our cardiovascular system because I felt like that was too new and, and the final results weren't well understood enough yet. I didn't talk about uh, a spin-off of the dusty plasma work in PK3 and PK4 that, that the Russians and uh, the Germans have done that has led to a possible method for improving wound healing. Because once again, that product is too new in testing. I'm not sure if it's going to be successful or not. So uh, I didn't talk about vaccine development uh, because right now it looks like the work that needs to be done on the ground to bring something to an actual vaccine for testing may not be successful. Now next year, if they get some momentum and get some funding and get some support, it might be again. 
And so these are all examples of the, the challenges. When those results come back from the space station, it takes a huge amount of work on the ground to make those successful. And that work requires funding not from space agencies, but from the private sector, from uh, commercial entities interested in developing new products, new drugs, new materials. Sometimes those make it, sometimes they don't. And so all of these stories will have an end eventually. Uh, some of them are midway through. Uh, I did want to show you uh, the list of the top 20 journals with ISS research results because they're journals with which most of you should be familiar. Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PLOS One, Journal of Neuroscience, and so forth. Key journals are finding that the results from the International Space Station are of equal merit to the research that's being done on ground laboratories and are of interest to people who are not doing research in space. And that's an extraordinary indicator of the value of the work being done on the space station today. At the uh, AAS uh, ISS Research and Development Conference, there were a set of awards given for top discoveries in microgravity, top earth benefits and applications, top medical advancements, and top exploration applications. And I did include those in considering this list. And so without any further ado, uh, and without any other caveats or explanations, I'll go to my personal, I'm not gonna take any responsibility or give anyone else responsibility for this list today, other than myself, I'll give you my top 10 list of what I believe are the most important uh, research discoveries from the space station today. So number 10, preventing loss of bone mass through space, in space through diet and exercise. So this is the result of the work of dozens of researchers from the very first expedition on ISS. If you look at, at the key set of papers here, there are about 10 papers that, that summarize the work and that have to be considered together as a body of work, and they were done independently by different groups. But the bottom line is that it has now been shown that that risk that was first identified in Gemini, that the Russians first started thinking about at Gagarin's first flight, that we have at least found one solution to the problem. There may be other solutions as well. But that if astronauts do the right set of high intensity resistive exercise with the right level of vitamin D in their diet and the right calories in their diet, they come home without losing bone mass density. That is huge. And, and the final publication was published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research because that's a huge result for those who do osteoporosis research on Earth as well. Resistive exercise has been the last thing that osteoporosis researchers on Earth have thought about for treating osteoporosis on Earth. And so seeing that it makes such a difference in healthy astronauts causes us, those scientists to think, well, maybe we need to go back and look at this, look at what this means mechanistically, look at does this cause us to rethink uh, the way that we treat osteoporosis on Earth. I don't know what the outcome will be of that rethinking, but that was why it was chosen as the cover article for the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, because of that broad interest across the osteoporosis research community. Number nine, and this is related in a, in a little related discipline, understanding the mechanisms of osteoporosis and new drugs to treat it. This work has been done primarily by a pharmaceutical company called Amgen. Uh, they did it on assembly flights to the space station where mice were flown, and they tested different drugs that they had in development for treating osteoporosis and muscle wasting in the mice. And because of these outstanding results, uh, we at NASA, working with, in collaboration with our partners, will all be reinstating a significant rodent capability on the space station. What Amgen found is in the first set of, of mice, they treated an osteoprotegrin inhibitor. And this turns out to be, uh, had really good results in the mice in protecting bone. And I've got a picture here. So if you see on the, on the little picture in the upper right hand corner there, uh, the first picture is a, um, a control mice, mouse on the ground. The second picture is a mouse that got the osteoprotegrin inhibitor drug. And the third is the mouse that flew in space and did not get the drug. And you, you don't have to do a whole lot of analysis to see that those are really significant results. Uh, that first result uh, let, was important not in creating the drug, but in understanding the mechanism of how the drug worked. And Amgen used that information to help in getting licensing from the US Food and Drug Administration that drug has now been on the market for over a year. It's called Prolia. It's almost two years now, called Prolia. 
And uh, I'm meeting more and more women uh, as I go around the world and, and talk about these examples who are actually taking this drug. It provides a, a really significant alternative for those women that can't treat, can't take the uh, other osteoporosis drug that's commonly used, and more and more women are being advised not to take that drug. So this has been a really important advance. There are two other drugs in the pipeline uh, that Amgen tested on ISS that are in uh, phase two, phase three clinical trials, and so we're still waiting to see what, what those results are. Number eight. Hyperspectral imaging for water quality in coastal bays. This work was done by the Environmental Protection Agency using an instrument on ISS called the Hyperspectral Imager for the Coastal Ocean. Uh, hyperspectral imagers have been something Earth scientists have wanted um, on satellite platforms for a long time. Uh, the, but those that have flown so far have had some challenges. Uh, early on, uh, one sensor was flown and it failed and it wasn't successful in orbit. Then NASA flew a prototype sensor and, uh, called Hyperion and operated it for a while, but it was not able to be fully calibrated. And so scientists have been playing with hyperspectral data. It's a gold standard because it lets you separate within one pixel, separate what you're seeing in the column. And for the coastal ocean, it's particularly important because it lets you separate sediment from pollution, basically sediment from the signs of algae or nitrogen pollution, algal blooms. And normally when things are really gray and mucky, it's very difficult to do that unless you have all of these hundreds of spectral bands to help you with that information. So the Environmental Protection Agency did a pilot project to take the data from HIPO and uh, go out and they sampled concurrently. So they set up the collections from the ISS so they could go out and sample. And uh, they would go out in their boats and they would take samples at different points and they developed an algorithm for the various coastal bays around um, the Florida coast. And this algorithm was incredibly successful in helping to predict where there was um, extra chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, indicating that there was a lot of nitrogen flowing in, in from the um, streams there and that was leading to production of algal blooms. So a huge advance for water quality. Now it's incredibly difficult to keep matching up uh, ocean observations and bay observations, but what they're hoping is that over time they could get to a point where the algorithm operates without any ground truth. And, uh, and they're continuing to work with the HYCO data to see if they can have that be successful. This is not only important for ISS, uh, because what this is doing is leading to people thinking about the next generation of higher resolution hyperspectral sensors, one of which definitely could be tested on the ISS. But also it helps people know what are the best parameters to put in a major hyperspectral uh, imager such as Hispiri, which is planned by NASA in the next the day. fundamental physics clean uh, by studying these in a model system on the ISS is incredibly powerful. And this was just published with a, a commentary in physical review letters this year. Number six, uh, the new process of cool flame combustion. This is an example of one of those pure discoveries that may or may not turn to something big later on, but just on its discovery value, it's cool enough, it merited a mention. Uh, so on the International Space Station, we have a combustion integrated rack and it, can, it has a, a, a module inside of it that allows for the burning of small droplets of fuel. And here you see uh, on the left in blue is a picture of a heptane droplet being burned on the ISS. And essentially, you know, if that, if that heptane droplet was being burned on, on Earth, of course, you would see the typical teardrop-shaped flame with a, a blue at the base and yellow at the tip. But because there's no density or buoyancy-driven convection in microgravity, Instead, it looks like this. That didn't surprise the scientists. We've known that. We expected it to look like that. And the experiments were just setting all the different parameters, trying to refine the models. However, what the scientists found is that after the droplet extinguished itself, after it basically smothered itself with combustion products and couldn't burn anymore, there was a glow that appeared a little bit later, about three or four seconds later. And, and on the right, you see in orange with the gain pumped up, an image trying to help to capture what that afterglow is. That was not predicted by any of the models of space combustion. And so that becomes a really novel result. Uh, the scientists are now planning a number of different additional experiments to try and figure out under what conditions this occurs and under what conditions it doesn't to really open out a new area of research. And uh, so this is an exciting one to see what the potential future will be.
Number five, a pathway for bacterial pathogens to become virulent. So this work was uh, done during the shuttle era and it's been pretty widely publicized. You may have heard about some of it, but you may or may not really understand the science underneath it. So I'll try to explain it. I think it's, honestly, it's important for everyone in the hall to at least take one of these examples and feel that you could share it with a stakeholder. That if you're in a high profile meeting with uh, someone who has some, some power over the future of space exploration, if you're able to tell that person one of the things that's come from the International Space Station, that will advance all human spaceflight in the future. Even if your interest is going to Mars or if your interest is uh, some other exploration pathway, if you know what the ISS is returning today, that helps to support the case for space for everyone, for every project. In this case, uh, scientists had used a number of simulations on the ground, microgravity simulations on the ground, and thought that it might be possible that when you fly bacteria into space, they would become more virulent, but they weren't sure. And so they went to our human research program, which is very focused on astronaut health, and said, you know, it's possible if there's some bacteria, residual bacteria in the food, it could become more virulent and astronauts might be at increased risk of becoming ill. So the human research program for that very practical need decided to fund the research. Let's go ahead and take some salmonella bacteria. Salmonella bacteria cause foodborne illness. And uh, they said, let's take them into space. Let's see if it really looks like they become more virulent. And the key discovery was that yes, indeed, they did become more virulent, meaning more able to cause illness when you brought them back home and infected some uh, unlucky mice. But more than that, the scientists identified a new genetic pathway. So by looking at the genes that were turned on and turned off in causing this virulence change, uh, they were able to identify a pathway for the microbe to interact with their environment and determine when it was time to try to make something ill. So salmonella is a very well-tuned bacteria. And it is, has adapted basically to identify when it's in a low shear environment, which happens in your intestines if you eat salmonella, and then flip a switch and go for it to, to make, your, make you be more likely to make you ill. And so the scientists were able to identify this pathway, which is re related to the ion channel signaling, the way that sodium and potassium ions are passed through the cell membrane. And that whole pathway was brand new. So that's very exciting work. Some scientists now have been testing a variety of other bacteria to see uh, whether or not those bacteria follow the same pattern. Is this ion signaling pathway true of all bacteria, only some? Is it only true of things that cause foodborne illness? There's a lot of scientific questions that opened up. And of course, there was some early promise that this might lead to development of a vaccine uh, for something like salmonella. As I say, that, that work hasn't so far uh, been successful, so it didn't make my top 10 list. But I think the discovery itself of this new pathway is a real symbol going forward of how biological science can make big jumps and get new knowledge by going into a novel environment. And that's why this made the top list. Number four. 43 million students and counting. So uh, the partnership worked together to compile all of the different education activities that have been done on the International Space Station to date. And one of the things we noted is relatively few of those were actually funded by space agencies. A lot of them were funded by uh, private companies or, or nonprofit organizations or even by the universities themselves because they believe so much in the education mission that they did things with their own funds to accompany their research in space. Across the five ISS partners, over 44 countries have participated in education activities, 25,000 schools, 2.8 million teachers, 43.1 million students, and 1.7 million of those students have participated in inquiry-based learning. Inquiry-based learning is, is learning where the students are test, developing and testing hypotheses of their own. And that's been shown in research to be a compelling way to motivate students to enter science and math. And so I bring this here because not because I'm talking about research results, but because I think it's very important to show how the research in education and what's being done on ISS coincide. In this case, the research on how you most motivate students uh, to pursue careers in science and math is right here in evidence in that so many of the students 
are not only getting the motivation of talking to an astronaut or hearing an astronaut demonstrate something on ISS, that's those 43.1 million students, but they're actually looking at the experiments in space, challenging them, testing their own hypotheses, and doing things in their classroom that go with it. And that kind of excitement is really important for motivating students for the future. Number three. Dark matter is still out there. So I have to apologize to all the astrophysicists in the room. There are probably at least a couple of you, because as you heard, I'm an earth scientist and a biologist, um, and I always feel uh, a little bit like I might be walking in the wrong temple when I start talking about astrophysics. But uh, you know, essentially, the alpha magnetic spectrometer is the most sophisticated sensor of galactic cosmic rays that's ever been available. It's much more sensitive than Pamela or Fermi, the previous instruments that could look at proton flux or uh, see the way that, um, that po uh, sorry, positron flux to see the way that positrons are coming at us. And uh, a key set of papers was published early this year with follow-ons and conference papers throughout uh, July. And I'll summarize those results in this way. Um, if dark matter is out there, you would see what you see here in the purple. Dark matter particles annihilating each other and producing an electron and a positron. And that should happen in every possible direction. But if all of your positrons are coming from things like pulsars, which you see uh, there with a P, or from other galactic sources, those should have a directionality. And what the first AMS results identified is there is no directionality that the positrons are coming from everywhere and there's way too many of them to be explained by all those other processes. So astrophysicists and, and particle physicists are very conservative and I, I put Sam Ting's quote right here. These observations show the existence of a new phenomenon whether from a particle physics or an astrophysical origin. So he won't use the word dark matter at all. But the fact is dark matter still fits the data and uh, and nothing else, none of the other theories out there fit the data as it exists today. Even more importantly, is the data published so far only goes up to 300 milli-electron volts. That's the range that Pamela and Fermi covered as well in the energies of the positrons that they could observe. So in publishing that data, you could compare the three instruments, and one of the things that AMS had is much more accuracy than any of the other instruments. And so a lot of noise that was in previous data can now be ignored completely. Everyone's very comfortable that the increase is a nice linear smooth increase with energy um, and that there are just way too many positrons and they're way too high of energy than we would predict from any of the other uh, sources in the universe. The most exciting thing to me about the alpha magnetic spectrometer is it's sensitive to one tera electron volt. So, so this data so far published only goes to 300 milli electron volts or sorry, giga electron volts, I'm getting my gigas and my millis wrong. Giga electron volts, 300 giga electron volts, goes to one tera electron volt. All of that data, every single particle that that instrument is measuring is in an energy range never before measured by humankind. So it's really exciting to think about what the next few publications are gonna be from the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Okay, number two, robotic assist for brain surgery. This is an example uh, that you may have heard about before. It's particularly compelling both as a space technology spin-off, where a technology that we develop for space, in this case, the technology that MDA developed for the, Can the Canadian robotic arm on the International Space Station, but it is also a research result because you couldn't just take the technology from the robotic arm on the space station and start doing brain surgery with it. There was a significant amount of research and groundwork that led to the development of this application. The, the robotics were miniaturized, and importantly, they can be operated inside an MRI machine so that they can do precision brain surgery. Here's a picture of one patient. Uh, it's interesting because new medical technologies get into market a lot faster than new drugs do. And so this, uh, this was being tested in patients for a few years. The first publication on the successes of NeuroArms and the outcomes of the patients just came out last week even though we've known that the neuroarm was being used in the test mode to operate on patients who agreed to be test subjects uh, for a few, near, few years now. So uh, this appears to be continuing to have greater and greater results, broader and broader application, and it's very exciting to see people whose lives have been saved, who are alive today, because of the International Space Station. 
And my last example, number one, and I'll, I'll presage this by saying two years ago, I would not have, have mentioned this one. I would have said it was one of those ones that looked compelling and then kind of went underground and didn't seem like it was going to be successful. But as the story continues to evolve, I'm much more optimistic again. And I think that uh, for duration of effort and for the compelling potential benefit uh, is, is why I selected this as my number one uh, research result from the International Space Station today. And that is a new targeted method of chemotherapy drug delivery. Uh, clinical breast trans cancer trials are now in development. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about this story. The story goes clear back to, uh, well, first to the space shuttle, but then to Expedition 5. On Expedition 5, over a decade ago, uh, there was an experiment flown called MEPS, uh, stands for Micro Encapsulation System. And uh, what this experiment was looking at is whether the properties of microgravity could allow you to assemble together micro balloons or micro capsules that would have the properties that you would want to focus them on certain kinds of tumor tissues. There was a hypothetical reason to believe in the physics and the self-assembly of these, these micro encapsulation uh, balloons that it might work in microgravity, but there was no proof. And nobody had ever made microencapsulation uh, bubbles like this on the Earth that had the properties that were desired. So the scientists flew the experiment. It was successful. They uh, took some microcapsules with those properties, tested them in some mice, um, and found that they improved the targeting of, uh, of tumors that had been injected into the mice. So it looked really good. But you can't depend on the space station to build these things and, and use them in, in clinical practice. So they had to sharpen their pencils and come back down and develop a machine on Earth that can make these in clinically relevant quantities. And that took them over five years, the, uh, from the time they got their space results until the first patent came out. Uh, a, a company called New View Technologies licensed the patent, and uh, then the team started working on getting their clinical trials approved. They actually got cl clinical trials approved, they were ready to start at MD Anderson, and they lost their funding. So that's why I said about a year ago, I would have probably been more discouraged. But now they have raised funding again. They've targeted a, new, a different tissue. Instead of targeting um, prostate tumors, they're targeting breast tumors um, because there are certain breast tumors that look like they have really good properties for this method to treat. And they are expected to, to they're working through now a set of preclinical trials to be ready to actually do, test this in a set of phase, phase one patients shortly. So this is a, uh, an example both of how long it takes for these benefits to grow and that how every step along the way things can go wrong and a, and a great example can fail and then they can come back because science is like that. A new discovery comes in, it may be ignored, then it's rediscovered, then it's thought through, then somebody adds to it and that is indeed the progress of science. So many of the stories I told you today are captured in the ISS Benefits for Humanity document, which you can, uh, you can just, don't try to copy down the URL, just Google it. It's been translated in seven different languages, uh, so it's available online in a, a variety of languages. And we work across the partnership, we're working right now to add stories and expand the stories from our last publication where there are more patient outcomes, uh, uh, better stories along the way. I definitely did not. I left a lot of things behind in picking my top 10 today uh, that kind of hurt me to leave behind, whether it's uh, purifying air in daycares or um, you know, protein crystal growth experiments. There are a number of things out there that have had some really compelling results, and, and I honestly could have picked almost any of them. The other thing that you can do is keep up on this information. Um, if your day job is working in exploration and you're really focused on something else, you still need to know what the successes are from the ISS because as, as our operating human space flight program, the ISS is the pathfinder for showing all of our stakeholders how the work that we're doing in space keeps making life better here on Earth. And you can follow that in a couple of ways. You can read our weekly news stories on nasa.gov. You can follow my Twitter feed at, at ISS underscore research. Uh, I have a blog, which I blog in, but we also bring a lot of guest bloggers from various scientists and students that are involved in ISS. And uh, you can also make sure that people see the ISS over your town. And so I want to conclude today 
with just one major thought for you. As, as I speak around the country and meet a variety of people, um, we in the space community, we sometimes lose track of what people do know and don't know out there. So one time, uh, my husband, uh, there was a great ISS overpass, and I sent an email to my husband because he works in a downtown office building, had, would have a great rooftop view, and it was right about the time work was getting out. And so I sent him an email saying, hey, tell people to go up on the roof at this time. And so he sent it out to some friends, and they sent it to some friends, and when he went up to the rooftop, there were about 100 people up there, and one of them was the vice president of the company. And, the vice and they watched the ISS overpass, and it was beautiful and amazing, and the, the vice president of his company went over to him and said, I am so glad you set that out. I had no idea there were humans in space. So um, we speak with our own captains of industry, but the captains of other industries aren't necessarily tuned in. And in fact, bad press gets a lot more resonance than good press. So people will hear that the shuttle is retired, or they'll hear that someone's complaining about the budget, but they don't necessarily hear all the good things that are going on. And so your mission in leaving this room today and your mission as a space professional is really twofold. First of all, you need to make sure that everyone you meet knows that humans are in space and that those humans are making our world a better place. And one way you can do that is by knowing one of these stories. And it doesn't have to be the same story. It doesn't have to be the stories I talked about today, but there are resources out there for you to learn a story. But what you need to be able to do is tune that story to someone you meet so that you can help them understand how relevant space is for their lives. And I challenge you to do that, and I thank you so much. I'm, I think I'll be able to take some questions. Thank you.